so this is the next question. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the questions, one of the questions I, that I pulled out in the last semester's virtual class session and I didn't have enough time to go through it. I'm glad that I have this chance to go through it this now. And because uh, this question I think will illustrate uh, a few things that uh, frankly confused me uh, when I was a physics student to study. So let me just jump right in. It says, uh, marble rolled down an incline at, oh, I have an angle, at uh, 27 degrees from rest. All right, that <laughs> seems simple enough. And it's asking for acceleration. Now, let me point out a trap that I think some people might fall into. If you are somehow remembering this formula for inclined plane problem, acceleration is equal to g sine theta. Let me tell you right now, that's gonna be wrong. And it really comes down to the fact that this was a formula that was derived for a specific situation, a block sliding down an incline. The situation you have now is different. It's a subtle difference, but it is different. So if you are simply using a formula that was derived for a different situation, it's not gonna work. And really, uh, Difficult physics questions are like this question here, which is deceptively simple. And the job of a physicist or an engineer is to work through the, the, all the details of the situation, distill out what's important and work out what the actual formula is. So let me do that. Uh, I like to start out with a diagram. So let me draw the diagram of the incline. Here's the incline at some angle theta. And I guess there's some kind of a marble that's gonna be rolling down. Uh, let me redraw the marble. There's some kind of a marble that's gonna be rolling down. Um, all right. Um, and it's uh, asking for its uh, acceleration as it rolls down. Mm -hmm. Because it asks for acceleration, it feels like it's a Newton's second law problem because you know that relates acceleration to dynamical quantities. So uh, let me start out with a free body diagram. If it's a Newton's uh, second law problem, I'm gonna need a free body diagram. Now, now that we are dealing with a uh, extended body, a rigid body. I want to, so my free body diagram will start to include a little bit more detail. I still like to keep it as uh, simple as possible, but one of the compromises you have to make is you have to kind of indicate size or sort of a geometric arrangement of the setup. Because uh, now, where exactly the force is acting, it matters. So you can not simply draw a dot and say, oh, that's my object. You have to be able to indicate exactly where the force is applying. So let me draw, I drew the circle as a representation of the sphere, the marble. And I'm drawing this dotted line as a representation of the, the slope so that I can draw exactly where some of the contact forces are at. So um, this is same as any standard strategy. I'm kind of thinking through, all right, what are my forces? So there should be gravity on this marble. And this is the special property of center of mass. When you are um, drawing a representation of gravity on a free body diagram, you can draw it as if it's acting on that center of mass. And this is a kind of simplifying principle that you can prove mathematically that doesn't involve any approximation. This is exactly true. And uh, um, what uh, useful here is that instead of kind of having to consider a force on an extended body that's acting throughout the entire object, you can just draw one simple force that's at the center of mass. So, okay, there's gravity. And, oh, and there's gonna be normal force at this uh, point of contact that's still normal, as in perpendicular to the surface, so normal force. Um, and, um, oh yeah, and, and it's at this point where I want to point out a, a kind of a shortcut that I imagine 
a lot of people will be taking. And it, you know, it gives you the right answer, so there's nothing wrong with using the shortcut. So let me outline the shortcut, and then I'm going to tell you why I won't be using it. And instead, I'll be taking the long route so that I can point out some of the things that I myself was confused with, you know, many years ago. <laughs> I was a fresh physics student. And I think uh, it might confuse you uh, when you're doing kind of a consistency check in the future. So I'm your instructor. I want to have the opportunity to point it out now. So first, the shortcut that you might be using. The shortcut is basically, it comes from uh, realizing that when you are looking for this acceleration, um, you can relate that acceleration of this point here with kind of uh, rotation about this uh, point of contact, the pivot point. So if you have some angular acceleration about that point of contact, and you have that acceleration, then they are related this way. That distance there, that's the radius of the sphere. So the linear acceleration of center of mass is the radius times angular acceleration. So your goal is to find the angular acceleration. So, all right, so you look at this as the pivot point and you see that, okay, normal force that's generating no torque. The only force that's generating torque is this gravity. Um, okay, so this is my lever arm here, um, and you can go through the geometry to figure out what the lever arm is. Then you have your torque is lever arm times the force, and that's going to be rotational inertia times angular acceleration. And I think one of the hints actually get it that uh, this rotational inertia, you have to make sure that this is about the pivot point. It's not about the center of mass. So there's a rotation inertia of a sphere about its center of mass. And what you have to use is the parallel axis theorem to figure out, okay, what is the rotation inertia about this point? And once you figure that out, then you use that to solve for angular acceleration. Once you have that, you multiply that to R to get the linear acceleration. So that's the shortcut. You are welcome to do it that way. It will give you a correct answer. And for the most part, it's conceptually correct. The reason I won't be taking that route is because having figured out the answer that way, this is what um, I hope if you spend on a time with this situation that what you will be wondering um, is that, well, so you look at this free body diagram and, oops, and you're, and you're looking at what forces are there, normal force and mg, and then you consider the net force well, net force gives mass times acceleration. And as far as the forces I have drawn here, um, they seem like they're the same forces that I have for mass sliding down an incline. So why wouldn't my answer be G sine theta? Why is that not the correct answer? So I hope you wonder that. And when you wonder that, what we have forgotten in previous analysis of this setup is that there is one more force. It's the friction force. At this point of contact, not only there's normal force, there's also friction force acting parallel to the uh, surface. And in the previous uh, shortcut method of analyzing this setup, I could have just ignored friction force because this was the pivot point. Friction force provided no torque. So ignoring it didn't change my answer in any way. But as you're kind of thinking about this setup and trying to make it internally consistent, you should find that, oh, I, without this friction force, there's no way to make this setup internally consistent. 
and it's really this friction force that's what's slowing it down so that the correct answer for this acceleration is a smaller than g sine theta. And um, I think I mentioned this earlier in the semester and it really ties to this um, statement that the marble is rolling, well, uh, down. I don't care if that it's down or up. The fact that it's rolling. And I have uh, alluded to this in the past where um, I guess in the phrase of we try to neglect the friction to the extent we can, um, except the situations where we can't. And when you have rigid body rotation, it's one of those situations where you can't ignore friction. Whenever you have a rolling motion, especially without slipping, you are going to need a friction. Friction is what causes rotating object, rolling objects to roll instead of simply sliding smoothly. So, so yeah, um, so, um, so I'm going to include this friction force in my analysis and just so that it's not entirely redundant. Let me do this in a slightly different way. So I'm going to use the full apparatus of a standard strategy. And um, so it'll be actually be a bit of a long route. It's gonna take longer than if you use the shortcut method, but this will help me fully justify the presence of that friction force and how that friction force explains some of the things that might have confused you as some kind of internal inconsistency. So yeah, uh, I'm following my standard strategy. I did a step number one. I drew my free body diagram and included all the forces, <laughs> finally. Uh, I need to do step number two, so that's uh, defining my axis. Uh, it's the same usual axis, well, usual tilted axis, x down the slope, y perpendicular uh, away from slope. Um, that kind of goes with the direction of acceleration. Um, all right, step number two done. Step number three, I need to break down my forces into components. And the only force that needs to be broken down are the gravitational forces. So there will be this component here, y component, mg cosine theta. I'm kind of going through a little bit quickly because we've done this so many times. Uh, I think, hope all this sounds familiar. Uh, step, step number three. Step number four is where I finally write down the mathematical expressions. And this is where I'm going to add some additional pieces from the fact that we are dealing with a rotational dynamics. So step number four is where I write down Newton's second law equations. And we are going to have the exact same pieces that we had before. We have net force along the x direction and net force along the y direction, giving the acceleration along those directions. So let me write those down. Uh, mg sine theta minus the friction force is equal to mass of the marble times its acceleration. And the uh, normal force minus mg cosine theta, it, uh, marble is not accelerating perpendicular to the surface, so that's equal to zero. And uh, so this is where we would have ended up previously, before chapter 10, before rigid body rotation. And I hope as you do your uh, unknown counting, you notice that you have friction force, acceleration, and normal force, three unknowns, two equations, not enough. And if you are somehow thinking that you could do, oh, friction, that's a friction coefficient times normal force. I, I hope you see that you don't have friction coefficient and even if you did, you can actually use that because this is technically static friction. So it's actually inequality. And, uh, so don't fall into that trap. Uh, you, um, yeah, don't fall into that trap. It's static friction. Um, so this is where you have to consider the rotation. And it, you know, it, it makes sense. It's, uh, it's rolling down. So you should, that has to be reflected in the mathematical description of the setup. So let me write down the 
rotational version of Newton's second law equation, which is that net torque. And so here, it's a rotation about the center of mass. So both the normal force and gravity are providing zero net zero torque because their lever arms are both zero. The only force that's providing torque is the friction force. That's why we had to include it. And the torque due to friction force will be the lever arm. That's radius of the marble, uh, which we're not given. So I hope it cancels out. <laughs> times the friction force is the net torque, and that's gonna be equal to rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. And, um, and this is the rotational inertia of a center of mass. And this is one sense in which this, is, uh, this analysis is simpler than the shortcut I was describing because uh, you don't have to use parallel axis theorem. You're um, considering rotation about the center of mass. Um, and uh, we have uh, angular acceleration. So one more unknown, <laughs> only three equations so far. So need one more equation. And, and that's gonna come from the fact that we are dealing with rolling without slipping. Sometimes uh, we call this a rolling without slipping condition. And that condition leads to this uh, setup where um, I have this body, which is, uh, let's say it's uh, rotating with some um, angular velocity omega, then the motion of the center of mass of V of that circular object is gonna be related to omega through this relationship, R times omega. This is the relationship that ensures that this point of contact is at rest, so it's not slipping. And uh, this, uh, uh, relationship uh, extends to all, all other kinematical quantities. So if you're looking at the displacement delta x, that's gonna be equal to r times the angular displacement delta theta, you know, keep on going above two pi. And um, if you have uh, acceleration, that's gonna be related to, to angular acceleration by r times angular acceleration. So there I can, Fine. So that's my finally fourth equation that has no additional unknowns. So I have equations one, two, three, and four. Now, staring at this for a bit, I realized that equation two is kind of useless because it's giving me n normal force, and turns out I don't need the normal force anywhere. So I'm just uh, not going to bother with the equation two. So looking at equation one, which contains the acceleration that we are looking for, if we just had a friction, that'd be great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of try to go through these other two equations, trying to solve for friction there, and then plug in into equation one. So let me get right on that. Um, I guess I need to plug in what the uh, rotation inertia is. So let me do that. R times the friction force is equal to, and I have this memorized. You can look it up in the table for yourself. The rotational inertia of a sphere around its center of mass is two-fifth mass of the sphere times its radius squared. Once again, you don't have to, uh, <laughs> not once again, <laughs> if you're watching just this question, you don't have to have this memorized. It's gonna be provided in a table. And when you look up the table, you will see that's the correct value. Times the um, angular acceleration, but let me plug in the result from equation four here. Solving that for angular acceleration, I get acceleration divided by R. So let me see what cancels. Um, this R cancels, one factor of R there, and the remaining R cancels with that R. Okay, so I'm actually rid of all the R's that's exactly what I was hoping for. Because um, I'm not given the radius of the marble. So it's one of those things that I wrote down. I wasn't given, but I was hoping it would cancel out. So let me solve this for friction force here. Friction force is equal to two-fifth times the mass times acceleration. Apparently it depends on the acceleration, but this is the friction force that's required to produce enough torque to keep the thing rolling. And if some other friction coefficient wasn't 
big enough to provide that, then you won't have rolling without slipping. Um, so let me plug that in. Plugging that in, what I get out of equation one is mg sine theta minus the quantity we derived to fifth ma is equal to mass times acceleration. Let me breathe a sigh of relief and cancel out them because we don't know the mass of the marble. I was always hoping it would cancel out as it often does when you are dealing only with the gravitational force. Uh, let me collect the uh, acceleration terms together. It's going to be plus two-fifths a. Um, and I can just add this, one, one a, so five over five a. So that's going to be seven fifths a. And solving this whole thing for acceleration, you get acceleration is equal to five seventh g sine theta. So this five seventh is that coefficient that's less than one and doesn't allow the answer of simply g sine theta to be correct. It has to be five seventh of g sine theta. And again, the reason this is smaller is because of this friction force, which causes the net force along the x direction to be smaller. So, so yeah, the, um, so that's what I wanted to demonstrate. That's why I went the long route. Um, uh, for part to be, um, you can do that pretty quickly. It's the kind of, uh, well, it's exactly the same kinematics you've been dealing with. You have the acceleration. Hopefully you remember the kinematics equation. Um, change in position delta x is equal to one half a t squared plus v naught t. And here initial velocity is zero. So you just plug in the numbers to get delta x. Um, 